Welcome to part one of Equilibrium Review with focus on how to describe and define an equilibrium state, followed by an introduction to the law of mass action, predicting shifts in equilibrium, and expressing the change by examining the reaction quotient Q. Many chemical reactions are irreversible. Thus, a forward arrow is used to represent reactants going to products. However, many reactions exist as equilibriums. That is to say that once products accumulate, they may go back to reactants, which requires an equilibrium arrow. A chemical reaction is said to be at equilibrium when the concentrations of reactants and products do not change over time. For example, if we have only reactant A at T equals zero, the concentration of reactant A will drop and the concentration of product B will increase. Equilibrium is when these concentrations do not change over time which are often one of two scenarios within introductory courses. In the diagram on the left, we see that products are very favored when equilibrium is reached, and the diagram on the right, we see that reactants are very favored when equilibrium is reached. And of course, one could imagine equilibriums in between these two scenarios. Remember, a system in equilibrium is a dynamic system. In other words, reactants are going to products and products back to reactants all the time. Thus, we can also say that when a system is at equilibrium, the forward rate equals the reverse rate, as shown. No changes with rates also implies the concentrations of reactants and products will not change over time. To indicate extent of a chemical reaction that is at equilibrium, the law of mass action is employed, or commonly called the law of equilibrium which is shown here in its generic form. This simple equation affords an equilibrium constant for a reaction at some temperature T, which is simply a ratio of product concentrations over reactant concentrations, all raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. The magnitude of the equilibrium constant may give us insight to the extent of the reaction. In other words, does the equilibrium favor reactants or products? Large values for K mean products are favored, which should make sense. After all, concentrations of product are in the numerator, and if K is large, then the numerator, or concentrations of products, must also be large when compared to concentrations of reactants, which are in the denominator. Conversely, very small K values indicate reactants are favored. A few items worth noting. Units are typically omitted for the equilibrium constant, and the value is for a specific temperature. Thus, if you change temperature, the value of K will also change, which is discussed later in this series. So let's look at an example reaction, the synthesis of ammonia from hydrogen and nitrogen, called the Haber reaction. Equal amounts of nitrogen and hydrogen were mixed, a concentration of one molar for each at 773 Kelvin. As we plot the concentrations versus time, we see that for every one mole of nitrogen lost, three moles of hydrogen are lost, and two moles of ammonia are formed due to the stoichiometry until the concentrations do not change after some time t. At this point, we say that the system has reached equilibrium because the concentrations of reactants and product do not change. Now let's calculate the extent of this reaction via the equilibrium constant. The concentrations of products and reactant were recorded and an equilibrium constant calculated at this temperature. Again, note there are no units for the equilibrium constant. In another experiment, only the product ammonia is introduced into the reaction flask at the same temperature. As expected, the concentration of product decreased and concentrations of reactants increased over time to obtain new equilibrium concentrations. When these final equilibrium concentrations were measured and used to calculate the equilibrium constant, the same value for the equilibrium constant was obtained at this temperature. Regardless of the amounts of hydrogen, nitrogen, and ammonia added to the reaction vessel, 
the concentrations will change so that the equilibrium constant of 0 0.0602 is obtained at this temperature. So let's prove this. What if we added random amounts of reactants and products? Will we get the same value for K at equilibrium? And could we also predict which way the reaction will shift to obtain a state of equilibrium? In other words, will more reactants form or will more product form? To answer these questions, we need to calculate a reaction quotient, abbreviated Q, using the given initial concentrations and compare Q to our known K value. Then we can predict the direction of the shift. The Q value is 4.50, which is greater than the known K value at this temperature. An easy way to predict shift is to abstractly imagine that the Q value will strive to become the K value. In other words, the reaction will adjust to afford equilibrium concentrations such that the K value of 0 0.0602 is obtained. For this to happen, the numerator has to become smaller and the denominator needs to become larger. Concentrations of products are in the numerator and they need to decrease, which is a shift to the left away from products. And the concentrations of reactants are in the denominator and they need to increase which is also a shift to the left away from products. In fact, when final equilibrium concentrations were measured, the reactant concentrations did increase and the product concentration did decrease, which confirms our predicted shift to the left. Using the equilibrium concentrations to calculate K confirms, regardless of the amounts of hydrogen, nitrogen, and ammonia added to the reaction vessel, the concentrations will change so that the equilibrium constant of 0 0.0602 is obtained at this temperature. At this point, it is worth our efforts to more thoroughly examine Q versus K, which are calculated from initial and equilibrium concentrations, respectively. There are three different possibilities for Q when compared to K. Q can be equal to K, Q can be greater than K, and Q can be less than K. If Q is equal to K, then the reaction is at equilibrium and there will be no shift. If Q is greater than K, then for Q to become K, the numerator must become smaller and the denominator bigger, which is the same as saying product concentration needs to decrease and reactant concentration needs to increase. Thus, the reaction will shift to the left. Conversely, if Q is less than K, then for Q to become K, the numerator must become larger and the denominator smaller, which is the same as saying product concentration needs to increase and reactant concentration needs to decrease. Thus, the reaction will have to shift to the right. Alternatively, one could imagine a number line to represent all values of Q and K. One end is zero because there are no products, just reactants, and on the other end will be infinity because there are no reactants, just products. So using the values for Q and K from the last example, we approximate where the given K and the calculated Q value will be on this number line. Because Q is greater than K on the number line, we see that Q has to shift to the left toward reactants and away from products. If Q was 1 times 10 to the minus 6, which is less than K, then the shift would be to the right to form more products. Remember, Q will strive to have the same value as K. So let's bring back the Haber reaction with the previous random initial concentrations and final equilibrium concentrations. What if we were asked to calculate the final equilibrium concentrations of reactants and product given these random initial amounts? So let's place these measured equilibrium concentrations aside for a moment and see if we can actually calculate them. The first step is to predict which way the equilibrium will shift which we have already done via the Q calculation. Because our Q value is greater than K, it will shift to the left. That means additional nitrogen and hydrogen will form 
and the ammonia concentration will decrease. From the stoichiometry of the balanced equation, we know that for every two moles of ammonia that decompose, one mole of nitrogen and three moles of hydrogen will reform, which we can write as our change. Now let's employ the law of mass action with these expressions and solve for x, which is 0.59. Now we can calculate our final concentrations as shown, and we see that our calculated values do match the experimentally measured equilibrium concentrations. To summarize, we first calculated a Q value, given initial concentrations, compared Q to K to predict shift direction, then expressed the change by examining the stoichiometric coefficients. We placed our new expressions into the law of mass action and solved for X, and deduced final concentrations which matched our measured final equilibrium concentrations. So let's examine a few examples where we were asked to simply predict shift and express the change. In this first generic equilibrium, we see that the initial concentrations are all one molar except for D, which is zero. Thus, a Q calculation is not necessary because we know that the reaction must shift toward product D if a K value is to be obtained for this equilibrium. This will cause the concentrations of reactants to drop and the concentration of products to increase. The change is expressed via the employment of the stoichiometric coefficients. When combined with the initial concentrations as shown, the final expression of change is afforded. An example equilibrium where one of the products is zero is shown. Again, we know the shift is going to be to the right to obtain a K value, and that the concentrations of reactants will drop and the concentrations of products will increase. The changes, negative for reactants and positive for products, coupled with the stoichiometric coefficients and the initial concentrations, yield the final expression for change, which can be substituted into the law of mass action to determine a value of x that allows calculation of equilibrium concentrations as shown. It is worth noting that determining the value of x does require some challenging algebra, so a readily available CAS called SIMPI was employed to afford the value of x. In the next generic example, we see that one of the reactant concentrations is zero. Thus, a shift to the left must occur if an equilibrium constant is to be obtained, which will increase concentration of reactants and decrease concentration of product. The changes positive change for reactants and negative change for product, coupled with the stoichiometric coefficients and the initial concentrations, yield the final change expressions. An example equilibrium where one of the reactants is zero is shown. Again, we know the shift is going to be to the left to obtain a K value and that the concentrations of reactants will increase and the concentrations of product will decrease. The changes positive for reactants and negative for product, coupled with the stoichiometric coefficients and initial concentrations, yield the final expression for change, which can be substituted into the law of mass action to determine a value of x that allows calculation of equilibrium concentrations as shown. As demonstrated, if one of the reactants or products is zero, the reaction will shift in that direction to obtain equilibrium. So let's do one more problem to predict shift and change with an equilibrium we are already comfortable with, the Haber reaction. Equilibrium concentrations were measured and recorded in this one liter flask, and an equilibrium constant calculated. While at equilibrium, an additional one mole of nitrogen was added, raising the concentration of nitrogen to 1.399 molar. If we are asked to calculate the final equilibrium concentrations, we have to first predict shift with the aid of a Q calculation, write the change, solve for X, and then calculate final equilibrium concentrations. So first, let's calculate Q so we can predict shift, which is 0.0172. Now Q is less than K, Thus, we predict a shift to the right toward products, 
which equates to a decrease in reactant concentrations and an increase in product concentration. The changes, negative for reactants and positive for product, coupled with the stoichiometric coefficients and initial concentrations, yield the final expression for change, which can be substituted into the law of mass action to determine a value of x that allows calculation of equilibrium concentrations as shown. These calculated concentrations match the experimentally measured equilibrium concentrations and as a quick check the correct value of K is also obtained with these new calculated equilibrium concentrations. In summary, we first did a Q calculation with initial concentrations to compare against the given K, which allowed us to predict direction of shift and express the change. Next, we place these equilibrium expressions into the law of mass action and solve for x, which afforded final equilibrium concentrations. As a final check, these equilibrium concentrations were placed into the law of mass action to calculate a k value and see if it matched the given k value. Many similar and more challenging equilibria exercises that employ the quadratic equation and introduce the 5% rule as well as Le Chatelier's principle are covered in the next video.